Okay, well, hi everybody. We'll give people just another minute or so to file in. I see we've already got a nice uh, number of attendees coming into the webinar and we'll get started in just about a minute. Okay, let's go. So, hi everybody, and thank you for joining us today. Welcome to this webinar. My name is Osha Safran, and I lead the U.S. operations of RSIP Vision. We provide AI and computer vision solutions to the world's leading medical device and industrial firms in a variety of vertical markets. And today, uh, so we do a lot of these webinars. Today, I'm going to be hosting a guest speaker, David Matheson, who is president and CEO of SmartWork. Uh, David will talk about. Hello, the everybody. Hi, David. <laughs> How's it going? Hi. Great to be here. Hello. Good. Yeah, likewise. Great to hear you here. And and we're going to talk on the topic of, as you saw in the Invite post-pandemic portfolio, managing innovation to drive, drive growth in the new reality. Uh, a few words about our company. For those of you who don't know us already, we're RSAP Vision, and we help our clients drive uh, innovation by creating effective AI and computer vision solutions. We go from research development and all the way to production, as you, as you can see here, we work in a pretty wide variety of application areas and imaging modalities. Uh, so, of course, feel free to reach out if you think that we can help. Uh, here are a few more examples of our work, and, and we're focused on these core enabling technologies of AI and computer vision. Uh, uh, that being the case, we tackle a pretty wide range of problems, uh, anything from segmentation of heart chambers and ultrasound, uh, 3D reconstruction from X-rays, uh, to pose estimation in a vehicle or even uh, create, correcting offset and color printing and many more. And in today's world, uh, these AI and computer vision capabilities are really playing a central role in many companies' efforts to achieve growth and gain a competitive edge. Uh, and uh, we uh, at RSAP Vision really feel fortunate uh, to be uh, at the place that we are at this time. Uh, many, if not all, of our clients are very interested in the question of how they manage their R&D efforts and how they manage their innovation portfolios in an optimal manner, uh, not only in the context of their work uh, with us, uh, but uh, in general. And of course, during the current pandemic, everybody's trying to recalibrate and adjust as best as they can to the new reality. Uh, really, uh, the world is trying to figure out not only how to survive, but hopefully how to set themselves up to actually thrive at least in the future world uh, post-pandemic. And uh, David uh, here is really an expert on this topic, uh, which is why we invited him to come and, uh, and talk at our uh, webinar. Um, a few more words about our guest speaker. So David Matheson is the co-founder of SmartOg, a Silicon Valley-based company that connects innovation and finance. Uh, with decades of experience, David has helped senior management of firms around the world improve their results from portfolio management, product development, innovation, R&D, uh, and strategy. He's the author of a best-selling book and numerous, numerous publications on this topic, a fellow of the Society uh, of Decision-Making Professionals, educator in strategic portfolio management, and advises numerous startups. Uh, so before we get started, uh, I'm going to try something new. Uh, I'd like to test drive a poll or two. And we'll be polling you uh, a couple more times over the course of the webinar. Uh, and at the end of the presentation, we'll open it uh, for general uh, open-ended uh, questions as well. Uh, so just to get started, the first time I'm trying this out, so let's see how it works. Uh, you should see the poll coming up on your screen uh, right now. So uh, the poll is in progress. Uh, the question is, what is your primary role in innovation management? Uh, are you involved in growth accountability as an executive role? Is it more program and project management? Are you a technological leader, such as, uh, you know, uh, R&D team leader, R&D manager, that kind of role or other? Uh, I see people are voting, so it's great. This is working. Uh, many of you have voted already and the results are coming in. Uh, and actually, there's a, a pretty clear uh, trend over here. We'll just give it maybe uh, uh, five more seconds or so, and then we'll pull up the results. So counting five, 
four, three, two, one. Okay. Thank you for cooperating. We're going to close the poll and share it. And here are the results. Uh, I assume that you can see them uh, as you saw the question. So I'll just read them out. Uh, and it's a tie. So 38% of you are in a growth accountability or executive role. 38% of you are in program project management roles. Uh, and uh, David, I think uh, in, uh, in his talk today is really going to speak to the concerns of both of these roles. 15% uh, of you are in technological leadership and 8% uh, are doing other. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, we're gonna pull up one more before I pass the baton to David. Uh, this is a related question. Uh, so the question is, uh, what types of decision-making are you typically involved in? Are you doing more choices across projects in an R&D portfolio? Are you, are you uh, uh, needing to choose between uh, different projects and different efforts? Uh, or are you more doing uh, technological choices within projects themselves, right? After, after a goal has been selected, are you doing uh, the specific decision-making how to achieve that goal? Or are you a contributor uh, to project execution? Thank you. So many of you have voted already. Uh, we'll give it just a, a bit more of time. Okay, we're going to count down. This is five, four, three, two, one. Thank you. And we have a clear winner. So 58% of you, uh, I do hope you see it on your screen, but in any case, 58% of you are involved in choosing across projects in the R&D portfolio, uh, which is great. I think uh, really what David has to share is, is going to uh, speak very strongly to this. 33% of you are doing technological choices within projects. Uh, also very relevant in 8% of you are contributors uh, to project execution. Uh, obviously, uh, those who are contributing on the technical side and on the execution side are, are also, uh, uh, their input is usually uh, highly valued in decision-making as well. Uh, okay, this is great. So I'm going to hide this poll and uh, pass the baton uh, over to David, who will now be sharing uh, his presentation. All right. Yes. Uh, he hello, everybody. Uh, this is David Matheson and Moshe. We have a, a small technical problem. I don't have sharing rights. If you could promote me to an organizer, uh, and uh, I'll, while we get started, uh, uh, while he does that. I'll, uh, <clears throat> I'll get started. Uh, there we go. Show a screen. Yep. And okay. So I think we're ready to go here. Thank you for uh, inviting me. Uh, it's a great honor to be here. And um, I want to talk about post pandemic portfolios. I, uh, but let me start by talking about my kids. I have two teenage children. And um, this whole pandemic has made them quite bewildered. And I think like many of you, uh, we're all bewildered and our kids are bewildered. Um, and, but my kids in particular are really kind of responding and reacting. My son's worried about the canceled prom. Uh, he's a senior. Uh, my daughter's a singer. And you know, a lot of performance stuff isn't happening right now. And they're just in this kind of reactive mode. It's, it's a time of great anxiety. They're responding appropriately. Um, and, you know, for me, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit bewildered too, and I'm a bit anxious, but there's a major difference, which is it's not my first calamity. And so while I experience some of these things like my kids do, I know that we'll come out the other side. And uh, in addition to responding appropriately to the circumstances that we all find ourselves in, I'm also working out how, how is my business going to thrive? How am I going to thrive? How are my kids going to thrive? in this new reality on the other side, which of course is highly uncertain, right? It's one thing for me to know that my son will eventually graduate and go to college and it'll all be fine. Uh, it's another thing to experience the loss of the prom, right? And I think this is a kind of metaphor for uh, managing innovation to drive growth into our new reality. So uh, Moshe has uh, introduced me already. Um, and so there's, uh, Quick summary of that, uh, basically mom's proud. Uh, I do a poll on how many of you had, have met proud moms, but I'm pretty sure I know how it will come out. 
Uh, he didn't mention my company so much, so Smarter Connects Innovation and Finance. We have a portfolio evaluation platform that uh, builds your capability to rely on how to drive the upside and on where and how much to invest. We're a combination firm. We have software that enables you to do this, evaluate projects, manage uncertainty, and so on. We also do consulting, training, and education, and change management to help make it uh, really work for you. So on to the pandemic. Um, we've done a poll on what is happening to innovation and growth uh, as a result of COVID-19. And you can see some of the highlights here. So the first question, uh, to what degree has COVID-19 disrupted innovation efforts? And 80% of our respondents face major, or, sorry, moderate or greater disruption. So things are really uh, pretty significantly changed. Um, and it's not a short thing either. Uh, the question there on the right, uh, some people are actually anticipating multi-year disruptions, some people not very much, but the average is eight months anticipated disruption. And uh, you gotta ask if, if innovation and growth investments are disrupted for eight months, that's gonna have a big impact on the downstream viability uh, or prosperity of the company. So I think eight months is, if the innovation gives you a sense of maybe what's gonna happen uh, maybe a year from now. Now, in terms of what's disrupted, that's the pie chart on the bottom. 78% um, see disruption in the allocation of resources to growth innovation. And in the, those following the pie chart, that's both the purple and the red quadrants. Uh, there's also some significant disruptions in execution, but I'm going to focus on the portfolio side here. And we've done some surveys to figure out um, what is the cause of these disruptions. And probably the largest one is cancel projects due to cut costs. I mean, companies are just hunkering down. They're trying to save money. They're trying to get through. Uh, so projects are being cut to varying degrees uh, depending on the situation. Another kind of uh, disruption in, in the decision making is uh, key resources unavailable. So uh, some folks I've talked to have said, well, they have a key partner and the partner has gone bankrupt or ceased operation. The company's dealing with small companies or maybe there's a test lab that we just can't get to. And consequently, the whole project grinds to a halt. And the last kind of thing, particularly for those who are in the supply chain for PPEs, is just um, it's, uh, it's a redirection to something really urgent. You know, it's just all hands on deck, deck to make masks and everything else is being dropped. And that is also disrupting projects. And it's not clear whether the, the disrupted projects will be picked back up or not again. So we're all in this kind of situation. Um, and uh, uh, we're all feeling a little beat up and trying to take appropriate action and, and figure out what it, what it goes on. Now, I, uh, one business calamity I faced with a, was a merger that failed. I was in a company that got bought. And um, as things were sort of falling apart, I was talking to a mentor of mine. And uh, she said, uh, you know, David, what's going to happen is the company is going to fall apart and reorganize along relationship lines. And I thought, you know, but it doesn't have to do with strategy or business logic. No, it was relationships. And this really puzzled me for a long time. And then it really hit home. It, it turned out to be completely true. Um, and the thing is, what do people do in times of hardship or calamity? And uh, stand by. We got. Uh, can I ask folks to go on mute, please? There's some there's some back chatter going on. Thank you. Sorry. Um, so to be a bit of noise in the audio. All right, go on. Yeah, you could you could mute. Until if you could mute everybody, Moshe, please. I mean, good news is we can take faith there. That's that's kind of cool. But, um, yeah. yeah so everybody, uh, everybody okay. should be muted. Uh, maybe it's some glitch. In All the right. Other. I'm trying to go, try to continue. Okay. Yeah, everybody should be. All muted. right. So I'm going to continue. So what people do is um, uh, they seek uh, in times of difficulty they seek comfort and security. That was the uh, the relationship Mormon side league. of this. Um, too far. And, and uh, mm -hmm. wow, that is yes. bad. On beat. It's on a beat. All right, stand by, guys. Let's try to unmute. All right, David, would you like to try again? All right, thank you. So, uh, yeah, I'll go back here. Um, 
so we're facing this situation and um, uh, what do people do in times of difficulty? Well, they seek comfort and security. That is, is a very human need to um, kind of restore order and, and keep things on track. So what do people typically do when faced with calamity, right? Well, so one thing they do is return to what worked in the past, uh, footnote, whether or not it's actually relevant for the future, but things you know how to do. You eliminate stuff that's unfamiliar. Uh, why? Because it's unfamiliar. Hyper-focus on what you can control whether or not it actually matters. Um, so just the sense of control is very important that people try to control stuff. They hoard resources and protect. So perhaps there's a powerful person who's just trying to make sure they have enough. Uh, they deny and flee uncertainty, put their head in the sand and so on. And this is a long list. I'm sure you have your favorites. Um, so I would just uh, let you add to the list mentally with what you've seen. But of course, this attitude um, might might explain a lot and give you a sense of what's going on. It doesn't really tell you how to drive through a situation. See, business is a kind of roller coaster in a way, and we are on a big drop. Uh, and the extent to which you thrive on a roller coaster ride is is a function of sort of your attitude and and what you do about it. Roller coasters are not everybody's taste. Um, so I was riding this very roller coaster, the Giant Dipper in uh, San Francisco, which is an excellent roller coaster, by the way. And on the first drop, we had this picture of me and a colleague. I'm the one going, woohoo there. And so, you know, I came out of this ride uh, happy, energized, powered up, ready to go and to take on the world. It was, it, was, I, it just, it powered me up. Uh, my colleague there, gripping that bar for dear life, um, he, he, was, he came out of this beaten down. He needed recovery time. Um, and it took him a while to sort of get back on his, uh, his feet. So, so in this roller coaster metaphor, what is the difference? What, what do you need to do during a pandemic and as you come out of a pandemic to make sure that you come out powered up and ready to go? So let's talk about a few things. I've already kind of mentioned this. Uh, the seeking familiar um, is a natural human reaction. And I think in these kind of circumstances, it's critical to embrace uncertainty. So let's talk about embracing uncertainty. This is the foundation. I imagine that pretty much everybody's long range plans are now um, completely uh, irrelevant. I mean, they've been blown away by these new scenarios. And uh, many organizations want a kind of magic certainty button where you can just push the button and all those assumptions will be true or close enough and you can just make some planning assumptions and get on with it. Well, I, I don't think our new reality is like that. Um, it, it's built on a, on a lot of uncertainty. So let's just do a quick check in with the audience and see how much uncertainty people actually face. So uh, your long range plan is invalid. Well, to some degree it's invalid. How much uncertainty is in your, in your uh, future? So we're gonna go to a poll. Um, it's a seven point scale. I've shown three anchors. So one is not much. And uh, Moshe, you can, uh, you can turn on the, on the poll. Uh, one is not much. We just need to replan to the new assumptions. Uh, make some new assumptions and replant them. Two is some uncertainty. Um, so uh, maybe, you know, it's not this as usual, but two or three major scenarios, and we're going to plan for a couple of those, and we'll be good. A seven means a lot. There are many uncertainties at, at many levels, project, portfolio level, corporate-wide. So uh, go ahead and um, uh, select in your poll. Moshe, I'll let you do the countdown. In the beginning, it was looking like a nice bell curve with three bins. But now, after mm -hmm. more people have voted, it's looking a bit different. Uh, yes. Okay. Let's do a countdown. Let's see. Uh, we're, we're about ready to go. We'll go five, four, three, two, one. All right. And you should now be seeing the result. Yeah, I see it. All right. Yeah, so Great. in the beginning, uh, everybody, everybody, it's interesting. Uh, the, those of you who answered quickly said some. We need to work a few, a few major scenarios. Uh, but then after more answers uh, started coming in, uh, more and more people started to say a lot of uncertainty. So actually, interesting the dynamics of how this poll played out. Yeah. Well, so 60 percent, uh, sorry, 80 percent, the top, the, the top two categories. 
yep. need to do something different, right? So your normal long-range plan is really built on number one. And 80% of you, uh, that method of doing your long-range plan probably isn't going to work. You're going to have to change. And, of course, those facing a seven are, are looking at a lot more radical shift from your traditional planning process. So let's see if I can, uh, if you can hide the poll results, Moshe, and then I'll go back to sharing. Okay, so I think I'm sharing my screen again. Um, so let's talk about a major inflection point. I think the pandemic, in a way, represents a kind of inflection point, and one of the inflection points I lived through, and I think it's still in, in living memory pretty much, is the iPod. The iPod swept away many industries and completely change things. And at the time, um, it, 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 was, it was almost acceptable to say, well, you know, we got blown away by the iPod. Um, and uh, it, it was that much of, of a change. So pretty much everybody missed the iPod inflection point. Well, not quite. Actually, um, HP didn't miss it. Um, and uh, they made a product called LightScribe, or they were developing a product called LightScribe. So you've got to go back to uh, circa 2000. I mean, this is a historical story, obviously. I'm, I'm, uh, um, I guess, uh, I'm calling about... Uh, sorry, there's some uh, cross okay, we're getting that cross talk again. We're, yeah. It sounds like a completely different webinar because all the participants are still muted. Yeah. And yeah, we're like and you know, tickets. some sort of glitch. And I'm going to try to mute, mute both, both of us this again day. and go back. All right, and let's see. David, uh, can do you hear me now? Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, all right. I think I think that did it. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. go ahead. Okay, uh, so... Uh, so who didn't miss the iPod inflection point? And, and uh, this was HP. Um, and they had a product called LifeScribe. So let's just rewind the clock a little to the context and history. Um, people were doing a lot of music sharing and uh, photograph sharing. And it was being done largely on CDs and DVDs. Uh, labeling these things was a giant pain. And uh, what LifeScribe did was it let you burn the CD. Uh, and then you'd flip the CD over and it would write the... Um, the label on uh, uh, using the same laser. And so you had these beautiful sort of uh, silk screen quality printed labels and they didn't miss the iPod inflection point. In fact, you think this would be a business that would pretty much get taken out by the iPod and um, they, uh, they didn't. It's kind of interesting how this worked. Well, so why didn't they miss this? And it fundamentally has to do with embracing uncertainty. Now, when they were evaluating this R&D, a, a critical issue is how many people uh, buy the special disc. This is a razors and blade business model, so the, uh, the light scribe um, units become pre-installed, but what, the way you make the money is people buy the special discs. And so um, you can see their analysis there. Uh, this was in their business case, 300 million drives installed, 15 million disc burned, that's 50 per drive. Uh, they had projections of how many people would use these special uh, drives. So that gets you to 25. It was based on a lot of customer research. So their margin of error was plus or minus 20%. If you looked at analyst reports for growth in CD and DVD media, they all looked like this graph on the right. The argument was over which standard was going to win. The world did not work out this way. This is the view from that time play point. But um, this was like, we have enough data full steam ahead, don't need to think about this. Uh, that was kind of the attitude of the organization, make the assumptions and proceed. But I think they were smart enough to actually embrace the uncertainty. And so they had a detailed uh, uncertainty discussion of the disks burned per drive. Now this is scenario based and also tied to the analysis, the economics of it. So the number of light scribe disks burned per installed drive, they started developing scenarios for what would make this a very high number. So like disk sharing is growing dramatic, dramatically. At this time frame, copyright resolution it might actually encourage disks as opposed to electronic media. There were a lot of security and speed issues on the internet um, and so on. And they felt that, so they developed these, these sort of uh, reasons to believe it, it might be high reasons for optimism. And they thought, well, actually, if the world works out that way, we might get 50 disks a year. That is, people will be burning these about once a week. 
on average. Uh, and then they went to the negative scenario. Let's be pessimistic about this. Okay, so there's internet or electronic media become dominant forms of sharing and storing. Uh, that's partially what happened, of course. But at the time, that was, that was really not clear. Um, and so that was a scenario. And, and then there was this little voice that said MP3 players might take off. And they said, uh, uh, at the time, an MP3 player was something a nerd could store a few songs on. And uh, that, that like minority opinion probably would have been put aside, except for the context of embracing uncertainty. So they had a discussion about it, and it turned out this all hinged on the development of the one-inch drive. Uh, they decided they could monitor that and see how that was developing. Uh, but they said, you know, if in fact that happens, then um, the whole market's going to change, and we can't sell this as a mass product. We have to sell it actually as a niche product into um, people who need physical media. Think of like wedding photographers or amateur bands that are trying to give out demo discs and stuff where they really need the physical product, and that turned out to be two a week. And so then for their base, they said their market studies are pretty good, so they'll do 25. So they did this actually on every uncertainty area in their project and uh, put this through an economic analysis. So this is something called the tomato diagram. And uh, the width of this bar represents the importance of the uncertainty. The scale at the top is a financial figure of merit and at present value, and the numbers have been changed to uh, protect the guilty. Um, so, uh, um, my, uh, my range of uncertainty here goes from, sorry, the, if you make the base assumption, the NPV of this is okay. So that's this vertical bar and you make assumptions about the prices and how long the product lasts and so on. Uh, but if this uh, number of drives purchased goes up to 50, then uh, this becomes um, a, 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 a great opportunity for them. If the number of drives drops to two, it becomes a terrible opportunity for them. So uh, this turned out to be like the main uncertainty in this list. Uh, one thing they were sweating bullets over was the cost, uh, manufacturing cost, which they felt to be between $3.10 and $3.70, and they were beating themselves up over getting the cost down, and it's true that lower cost is better, but it doesn't change the nature of the business in that kind of dramatic way. Well, so we all know what actually happened, which is uh, the MP3 player came out and it was, uh, it completely changed the paradigm, right? Digital music went from sharing to carry all the music. And because Lightscribe had been able to respond to this, they saw this coming, they saw the one inch drive coming and uh, they very quickly changed this up and made a, uh, a very significant success. So as of uh, May 2009, say it's a historical story, they actually had uh, delivered this into many, many brands. Maybe it wasn't the um, home run that HP was hoping for, but they certainly made a solid innovation success in a time of absolute calamity. Um, and uh, I believe to the state, but certainly at this time, it was HP's only inside brand. So tremendous success in the face of tremendous calamity by embracing uncertainty. And that represents the kind of foundation of how you make your way through a calamity like this is to really embrace that uncertainty, talk about those scenarios, understand what really drives the upside and the downside in very specific ways. But um, that's only the foundation. You've got to take it a little further. So let's move to the sort of next element. Uh, going back to my roller coaster analogy, you can see my friend is gripping that safety bar uh, like his life depends on it. He's focusing on control and reliability. But the innovator, the person who's enjoying the ride, isn't, is, is focusing on what does it take to create the upside, even if it's a little uncertain or a little unspeculative. Once you understand the uncertainty, the question is what makes the upside happen? Focusing on reliability and control tends to make opportunities small. So let's focus now. What do you see is the nature of your opportunity on um, during this pandemic? So let's talk about driving the upside. So we have another little poll here. How much opportunity do you see versus threat 
as you come through the pandemic? Is it mostly threat? Is it a balance of threat and opportunity or mostly opportunity? So Moshe, if you could run the poll. Yep. I'm already surprised. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is good. Okay, so most of you have already voted. I'll give you a few more seconds. Okay, here we go. So, uh, 44% balance of threat and opportunity, 39% mostly opportunity. And here actually, interestingly, the, the fast responders were saying opportunity, but then it balanced out more and 17% were saying mostly threat. Yeah, well, I suspect people on this webinar are kind of innovators at heart, right? And so you see opportunity in, in every situation and that's part of the point I'm trying to make. So we're all kind of the same uh, tribe here, I suppose. Um, yeah, Moshe, if you could hide that poll and the uh, share again. Okay, so um, it's, uh, it's mostly opportunity and balance of threat and opportunity. Now, there are many folks who saw mostly threat, but of course, it's not just the organizations that see the threat of the opportunity, it's the people in the organization. So every complicated organization has some people who are sort of choked up with the threat and some who see the opportunity. Now, um, where this goes is what kind of projects do people fund? And I, I think you've got to look at this sort of competitively. Uh, and I find companies find themselves in two modes, playing not to lose versus playing to win. Now, when my son uh, was eight, 10, I was a soccer referee. And uh, you spend most of your time to, uh, tying shoelaces, honestly. Um, but um, that's a everybody gets a trophy game. And and so that's kind of, uh, you do what you can, you participate, you do the next thing, you get a trophy. And I think the businesses, when faced with threat, focus on just, you know, staying in the game in a way. But that's playing not to lose. Many competitive industries are more like the two races on the right. Uh, these guys are both completely awesome. Um, and one of them will win and go with the glory, and the second will lose and uh, be forgotten forever. And so you gotta ask, what is the nature of your competition? And what are they doing during the pandemic? If you play the not to lose game and somebody else is playing to win, I think I know who's gonna win. Um, so uh, let me give you some examples though of what it means to play to win in more kind of a uh, tangible kind of way. So we, uh, I know a company called Rogers. They make materials that go into um, electronic material, or basically electronic. And uh, in the army uh, or military generally, uh, frequency hopping radios are a big deal. They're very strategic. And um, it turns out they're kind of hard to do because the materials in the electronics actually interfere with the ability to transmit the radio waves. So you need to have very specialized materials it's hard problem and Rogers know how to do this. Um, now in this picture, we're talking about, by the way, uh, uh, presenting radius for, for military vehicles as, as shown here. So uh, if you look at sort of Rogers decision-making process, they said the future is frequency yapping radios. The military, their customers said yes. And so they had a project going to demonstrate this with the Army Rangers. Uh, it's very technically focused, very focused on proving, proving it out. Uh, so that, that all looked good. Big strategic project, getting lots of momentum with the customer. Then uh, finance got a hold of it, and they actually counted up how many customers would buy and how long it would take them to buy and all that kind of stuff, and they figured out that this project had a terrible return on investment, and so they said this just isn't worth doing. So how is it that the biggest, most strategic project isn't worth doing? Um, so they backed up a little bit and embraced uncertainty and looked at, instead of making some assumptions, they said, well, what is it? What are the scenarios here? And it turns out when you do the tornado diagram, the big uncertainty is driven by the degree to which the military standardizes on this type of radio. Uh, and this, by, this changes the project from a, a, a huge success to a tiny little thing. And indeed, there's an implicit assumption in this idea of it being strategic. The problem is that the project they're pursuing, the technical demonstration, does absolutely nothing 
to deal with the standardization issue. In fact, it leaves the most important uncertainty up to chance. So the technical folks, they got wind of this, they figured that out, and they said, well, you know, this it's not our job. We can't do anything else. So we're just going to participate, hoping to get a trophy because they're playing not to lose. They're going to be successful with their radio. Uh, well, the executives got wind of this because this upside was visible. And uh, they said, no, we, we have to tackle this issue. And so they went to the vehicle manufacturers and said, um, sort of an executive level discussion and said, well, what do you think of frequency offering radios? Yes, that's great. Uh, if we build the radio, will you, uh, will you make it a standard feature? And they said, no. Can't do that. We don't have any customers. Um, and so Rogers said, well, what if we give you the Army Rangers? And so they kind of brokered, uh, made that pilot sort of including the product, gave visibility between the manufacturers and the pilot, got the manufacturers on board. And suddenly this key uncertainty, which was being left a chance before, now gets worked and it drives the upside. So that's kind of what I mean by seeking the upside, and you do that by understanding the uncertainties that really drive it. Now, I have seen this over and over again. Um, one case that comes to mind was uh, for a pacemaker company. They were really trying to make the better pacemaker, but it turned out that what drove the upside uh, was the imaging system that allowed for the surgeries, and if the imaging was good enough, then they could um, do lower dose x-ray faster surgeries, and that would dramatically increase the usability and open up new segments for them. So, this sort of thing shows up over and over again in many different industries. Now, I have an example here that actually quantifies this. This is a different company. Um, we'll call it uh, Project X because they want to disguise it. Uh, and um, the project started as a unique material to be used on an extremely well-known branded surface. And they responded to that. They said, oh, my God, this is strategic, a big, huge thing. Uh, and they responded to that with the project plan that's shown in orange, sort of responsive technical support. We're going to qualify the material. We're going to work it. And if you do that analysis, it has an, uh, a value of $30 million there, shown at the bottom of the orange column. Uh, management said, well, wait, this is a, this is a huge issue. What, what is, what's going on here? And so they kind of looked at it, again, from a point of view of what is creating the upside, and they realized that it was the business relationship management um, how you treat it as a branded relationship could make a big difference. And a revised project plan has a base case of $300 million. Now, you may say, well, why did they just go for the $300 million? But there's a, well, why didn't they start with the $300 million? And part of the reason is, if you look at that blue bar at the bottom, the blue bar at the bottom is much bigger. So there's a lot more risk or uncertainty in the blue project. You can't control or predict it as well. But the, but the risk is actually upside risk. So the point is, just because it's uncertain doesn't mean it's bad. And that's what people mostly assume. Uncertainty may be the upside, and it's the visibility to the upside that gives you the ability to steer towards it. So it's a very, very big deal. This project is a 10x kind of improvement. So what am I really trying to say, which is don't lose sight of your big idea and steer towards it. Um, so and it's, it's more than just having a big dream and, and a vision. It's actually connecting it to the financial uh, outcomes so that you can steer and, and, and look towards it. So let me show you an example of how this kind of works in a portfolio over time. Here's a, a different Project X from a different company. This is a, this particular example with a, an agricultural products company. Uh, but again, I've seen this effect in many places. Now, what's ha th these products take a long time to develop. So the year at the bottom is the year they do the evaluation and they repeat the evaluation annually. Um, and so the project starts at 2010 and has a valuation there shown in the blue bar. That's called the promise. And what most companies do is they hold you accountable to the promise. And that means your best outcome is actually the promise. So had they done it that way, they would have gotten a, uh, a project value worth that first blue bar in 2010. Now, they had the Trinity diagram. They had visibility upside. And the upside is controlled by things like how much of the value proposition can they extract in terms of the willingness to pay and can they craft a product that, that does that? Uh, there were some market segments that were interested. 
but they weren't really sure how much, um, and uh, things like that. And so they start proceeding on the project. Well, they reevaluate it in 2011, and you can see the value goes up a little bit. Uh, 2012 goes up a little bit more. You might say that's just sort of estimation error. In 2023, there's a breakthrough. And the value goes up a lot because they realize their assumptions about pricing and willingness to pay are wrong. Uh, and in fact, there's more value there. So they reformulate the project and it jumps up. It's now approximately double the value of the starting position. 2014, not much changes. 2015, they figure out how to get into a new segment and so on. And you can see by 2017, it's actually worth five times as much as it was when they started. Uh, and so that ability to, to seek upside and have visibility upside is just tremendously important. It makes a huge, huge difference, 5x, 10x. I'm not saying every project is like this, but enough of them are. If you thought about this from a portfolio view and you said, well, I, you know, I, I'm just going to hold everybody to the promise uh, versus a different portfolio where you let them have visibility upside, you'd get five times the return or maybe five uh, – you know, the winners would cover the losers. You could actually throw away some of the promised ones, and you'd be better off if a few of them hit their upside. So that leads me to the last uh, kind of major point. Uh, the foundation is embracing uncertainty, and the pillar of driving growth is uh, driving that upside. Let's talk about how the whole thing comes together, and uh, that has to do with how your portfolio comes together. So uh, you can see my friend here on the roller coaster is looking for safety. And in particular, in his portfolio choices, he's going to make safe bets. Whereas I've got the woohoo attitude, and I'm going to try to build a growth portfolio. So let's talk about what it takes to build a growth portfolio. Now, I'm sure many of you actually believe you have growth portfolios, but I would like to put to you that I invite you to consider that maybe you don't. My experience is actually few companies have growth portfolios. Um, uh, as shown by this cartoon, Covet Enters Investment. It's not really a growth or a doubt portfolio. It's more of a feel-good portfolio. You see, portfolio processes are conflict resolution processes in organizations. So you have to look at the balance of power and how people share. Um, so when you have conflict to invest in, say, innovation or more incremental research, uh, more incremental efforts, um, you know, generally the way those processes work socially is you can't agree everybody takes some of the pain. And there's maybe a peanut butter approach or people make arguments, but you sort of split the difference so that everybody can kind of feel good. And rarely are feel-good portfolios actually growth portfolios. So uh, we mistake compromise, political compromise, for balancing a portfolio in a good way. So I would invite you to consider that, uh, generally speaking, and also I think the pandemic has changed the ground rule, so maybe there's a double need to reevaluate your portfolio. But so what does this do if we're talking about how people feel about their portfolios and we're in a pandemic time where people's feelings are towards comfort and security? Uh, if you add, do what's familiar, do what's reliable in the sense of predictable and I can count on it, do what I can control, do what's safe, that's like a recipe for mediocrity at a time when the opportunities are just opening up because the world is changing. Like the iPhone, we are at a, at a, a sort of turning point or a marking point. And so you might say, well, okay, um, maybe I've got mediocrity, maybe I don't, but, but maybe where does the growth actually come from? Well, it turns out we've looked at some companies, and here's one that has gone public with it. Um, this was uh, uh, the Safety Construction, a $4 or $5 billion division of DuPont. And um, in 2018, so this is a, uh, they're forecasting their revenues four years out. So uh, that's the 2022 forecast revenue. And they're adding up where these revenues come from by project type. And so that, that green bar represents the revenue contribution from what they call bread and butter. Now, bread and butter projects are these reliable, safe, incremental projects. And the thing was, those get you about halfway there. Uh, they also had what they called the oyster projects. So these are these riskier projects. They have upside. They need to be, you need to pivot. You need to create options. But they're these kind of wilder ones. They call those oysters. And if one of those succeeded or two of them succeeded, that would hit the goal. It's not that all of them are going to succeed. In fact, most of them will fail. But you don't need many to succeed to put you over the top in terms of your growth goal. 
And I remember talking to the president of the divisions. He said, well, tell me which ones, and I'm going to go tell them to perform and, and get a kind of whip the horses harder attitude. I'm like, no, actually, it's a different way of thinking about drive and growth. It's about seeking that growth and giving people the chance to kind of explore and pivot and so on. Uh, now, the other interesting thing about this is the orange box, which is if you want to exceed your goals, if you get one or two oysters to work, and they had enough that there's a very high chance that one or two oysters will work, um, but if you get lucky and more than a few work, that's the upside. And in fact, it's as large as that upside is as large as some of their existing line of businesses. So the, uh, the bottom line is that reliable projects are usually inadequate to hit real growth goals. I mean, you can change your growth goals so you accept mediocrity, but if you're actually trying to thrive and prosper, you actually have to build your portfolio around some of these projects. Now, I would submit to you that there are many of them. So this was sort of DuPont's finding. They had hundreds of projects. And um, what I'm showing here is each of these sort of blurry lines is an individual project, and the bar is how much upside there is. So you can see that second project has a massive upside. The fourth project down, massive upside. And so many, there are enough projects in here with massive upside that just focusing on that a little will produce huge outcomes. Um, because of the, the 10x, 5x nature of this upside. Uh, and prior to doing this, teams had been systematically thinking small because they wanted to deliver on a promise. So they never even saw this upside and indeed it kind of uh, dumbed down their own portfolio. But you might say, oh, I, I know I have some growth potential. I know I have some big upside projects. I may not get it, but I'm going to go for it. Well, what, what actually is the obstacle to funding some of these projects? And, uh, Fundamentally, in a portfolio setting, it's actually the other project. So the greatest obstacle to a big idea is the clutter of little ideas. And uh, there are lots of good reasons to do all these little ideas. There's a customer that wants it, or it meets a need, or a developer relationship. And usually the reasons are urgent and immediate, and they just don't matter. Um, they're nice to do. You need to do some of them. Don't get me wrong. You actually need to do a lot of these. But the point is, that the little ideas tend to clutter the portfolio. Uh, so if you look at the same graph again, and you look at the small projects, the ones that don't have a chance to really drive growth, it turns out there are a lot of them. And this is true of every portfolio I've ever looked at. Um, and you know people need to do some of those, but they don't need to do many of them. And uh, this is a decluttering opportunity because they just don't make a difference. And I have found typical portfolios have 30 to 40% uh, kind of um, decluttering opportunity. Now, people often argue that we should do these because they're cheap and they're easy, um, and uh, that's, that argument is, is incorrect. It's not the investment cost of, a, of these little ideas that's the, pro that's the problem. It's the opportunity cost. It's the distraction from the bigger ideas that's the real cost of these little ideas. So I would invite you to consider how much decluttering you might have in your portfolio as a means to build a real growth portfolio. So we've talked about, oh, sorry, the last thing to say is I think COVID has disrupted many of these little ideas. So some of these projects that have been put aside uh, or disrupted in some way, maybe people are realizing they don't have to be picked back up again. So there's a kind of an opportunity here. And so uh, to kind of review, the foundation is embracing uncertainty. The pillars of growth are driving and seeking the upside. And of course, the, the building of the roof comes from using that to build a portfolio that's going to grow, even though you may not be able to predict any specific project. So let's come kind of together. What should you do now if you're going to thrive in the future? You should embrace uncertainty. You should drive the upside and build a growth portfolio. Um, maybe in closing, as we come out of this pandemic, folks know that the world is different. And uh, this is a time to use that and to accomplish a real growth portfolio. So don't let a good crisis go to waste. Many of us are feeling beat up and bewildered and overwhelmed and have responded to the new situation and are worried about return to work and all these things. Um, but the thing is, uh, this needs to be done, but it's not the only thing that needs to be done. In fact, when it's probably the most important time to focus on the long-term strategy. Those long-range plans are disrupted. You see, you're disrupted, and your competitors are disrupted. 
So right now the race looks like this. And uh, everybody's stumbling. So who's going to be the winner? It's the one that gets up quickly, focuses on the road ahead, and figures out how the race is different. Um, maybe they're going from a track to something muddier, right? The future course is not going to be the same smooth track you've been running on. It's going to be a different road ahead. So it's the people who get up quickly and focus on that road ahead are the ones that are going to win that race and fly. So I would invite you to consider, uh, you know, I'm painting a dramatic picture here uh, to make my points, but um, I would like to ask you, just think of your portfolio and how much of it needs some kind of fundamental rethinking if your goal is to drive growth in the post-pandemic world. So like you're going to fill out the sentence, X percent of our current projects are either not the right ones or have to dramatically change if we're going to drive growth in this post-pandemic world. And your choices are a little, meaning less than 20 percent, some 20 to 40, about half, meaning 40 to 60, most, meaning 60 to 80, uh, almost all, meaning greater than 80 percent. So uh, Moshe, if you could run a little poll here. Right. Okay, here we go. So wow. how much about about half. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> yeah. This time we so, got to go. uh I <laughs> Yeah. That's pretty interesting. So, I mean, some of you, what is that, 8 6%? Uh, I can't read the number exactly. Uh, you know, need to make a few tweaks. So, go for it. Um, but uh, it looks like about half and more, uh, those two numbers out to what, 60, 65%, um, have, have to do a radical rethink of your portfolio. It's like um, everything you know, um, know is wrong in a way. So I would invite you to think about what, what methods would help make that happen. Uh, so if I come back, if you could close the poll so I can share again. So let me ask you what needs to be rethought. And I think there are two kinds of things that need to be rethought. Um, the first one is across the portfolio, where and how much to invest, how do you reduce clutter, how do you achieve growth objectives, um, and, or, or maybe the individual opportunities themselves have gone wrong, right? You need to reassess the potential, you need to update your hypotheses, you need to prioritize experiments. That picture there is smart art running a workshop doing assessments. We do assessments on both of these across the portfolio and for innovation opportunities. We have a 90 minute online version that we're doing uh, for free uh, now because it's needed. And so if you were interested in assessing either of these areas, uh, please reach out directly by email and uh, we'll help, help make that happen. Um, so maybe to conclude, I see we have five minutes, and I'm going to leave a little bit of time to question. Um, so think about what needs to be rethought. And uh, let me conclude maybe with this image. There is a break point that we're crossing over with this pandemic from, an, from a, a successful past to a new kind of future. And right now, we're like this uh, jumper here, kind of suspended in the middle. Um, and what I'm saying in a way is uh, it feels uncomfortable to be suspended in the middle. But what you got to focus on is the new terrain, how you're going to land, where you're headed once you're across, and really rethink your portfolio uh, to, to grow in a post-pandemic world. And I think those that can uh, do that are, uh, are going to get a significant advantage over there they are competitors who are also disrupted, and uh, that's what's going to make the difference between uh, which companies are on top in three, five years, and those are not. It's the ones that take that moment to look ahead and adjust their portfolio accordingly. So with that, that's my formal remarks. Thank you very much. If you're interested in those assessments, you can email me there. And um, I think we have a few minutes for questions. So I think Moshe has been collecting some questions here. Yep, so I think we got time for a couple of questions. So uh, the first one is a general question from Steve. Uh, and this 
this this sort of speaks to a lot of what you've been discussing. Embracing uncertainty makes sense in this environment, as you say, is probably the only way to find opportunities in the current business climate. Yet we're in a period in which we can see even more uncertainty rather than a return to normal levels of stability. So how do you suggest R&D investors continually update their forecasts as things either get more uncertain or more stable? So what's the process for updating our forecasts? Yeah. Because uncertainty well, seems to be increasing I, I, so far. Right. So I showed you in uh, Lightscribe that tornado diagram, the idea of understanding the implications of uncertainties uh, at the project level in concrete financial terms. And um, at the portfolio level, you can roll that up. And so the idea that your plan um, is a single set of assumptions that produces a single result, I think is kind of a mistake. So you've got to sort of ground it in the uncertainties and then ask, well, what are the different outcomes I might get in terms of my plan? So uh, certainly, by all means, have a base set of assumptions. Uh, by all means, have some different scenarios for how the world works out. Uh, a lot of the action will also happen at the project level. And by rolling that up, you can understand what the scenarios are for your whole portfolio and for your company. And so then when things, so, so that's, I think that the, the method has to be built on uncertainty to understand your portfolio and make your forecast. If you do that, then updating as uncertainties change becomes much simpler. Um, and uh, because now you know that we're hitting the upside of that, or now you know that this world is happening. Well, you've already sort of sketched it out in advance. Um, the, uh, and so that makes the ability to update and rapidly adapt uh, much, much lower. Uh, one other comment I would make in this space is uh, when people do their forecast, they often plan in a lot of detail. And it makes a big brown out. And if you have to plan and replan for every scenario, that's a huge difficult cost. So again, go back to incorporating uncertainty from the beginning, do it in a lightweight way. You'll spend a smidge more time doing that. But once you've done that, um, then you're not planning and replanning because things adapt. So it's actually a much uh, more robust and faster way of coming to your portfolio decisions before you get into your annual operating planning and the level of detail it takes to do that. Do it lightweight. Correct level of detail, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, uh, th there's one more specific question here, actually, uh, that's uh, very interesting about the first Project X. So you had the the, si the tornado diagrams. Uh, yeah. So you, ha you had there, you had the orange version of the project, right, with the, the low upside and the low uncertainty, and there was the blue version, and that one was yes. was high uncertainty and high upside. Uh, but another question yeah, here this is slide. this one. So what 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 were the differences between the orange and blue versions in terms of the amount of investment uh, required, and what what are your recommendations for managing that? I mean, I would I would guess well, these two versions of the project would look quite different in terms of investment and perhaps in terms of time to market, uh, what, how, 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 what are the best practices for managing that in, during uncertain times? Yeah. Well, so um, I think implicit in that assumption is that the blue plan costs a lot more. Yep. And that's not true. Uh, the blue plan costs about the same. Uh, maybe a little bit more, but it, it's not significant. See, the, the thing in the orange plan was they were focused on what was comfortable and in particular being a responsive technical organization. So they were doing a lot of qualifying of their material. Remember, this is a special material that's going to go into a highly branded surface. And they were basically over-investing in the technology. Uh, so it had quite a significant technical team, and they were working at every little corner and angle. And their best prospect was to kind of sell this material by the pound. Uh, the other plan does a little bit less on the technical side, but actually you could just say it's the same, more or less, but it adds people who are worried about the business relationship. So they go and they ask questions like, what impact would this have on your brand if this material were great? And what, what attributes are you actually looking for in a partner? If you're going to make this part of your brand, well, it's not just one product, it's every product. So what, what makes that work? And um, what that fundamentally does is instead of selling this by the pound, 
you can value price it as a, as a business partner. And so they're really adding a little bit of um, business or relationship management resource uh, to really guide the technical project and make sure that the customer need is being really well met. Um, so if you kept the technical project the same, you're adding an FTE or maybe an FTE and a half on maybe an order of five or six technical folks, but you could actually probably dial down the technical people if you needed to pay for it because they're, they're overdoing it. So, so it's not necessarily the amount of investment. It's, it's really rethinking how to focus your investment uh, correctly. Yeah, like what, what actually drives the upside? You know, the, the technical folks assume that if we get the perfect technical product, then everyone will beat a path to our door and it'll be awesome. And that's only half true. So, uh, yeah. Okay, so I think we're just about out of time. And uh, yeah, I'd like to thank everybody. Uh, you're very uh, welcome. We'll be, we'll be in touch with the next uh, webinars and the next topics here at RSAP Vision. Uh, you're very welcome to reach out to either one of us. And uh, thank you very much. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, David. Yeah, and if you would like to, yeah, yeah, if you would like to ask more questions, feel free to email them to me. And uh, if you're interested in, in one of these assessments, let me know. Thank you so much for having me, Moshe, and uh, the attendees. I really appreciate the chance to share these ideas and I look forward to an ongoing dialogue as we work our way out of this whole situation. So thanks again. Absolutely.